We are going to cover link queries. Um, and link is a query language <coughs> that uh, C Sharp, Microsoft developed. Um, you can actually use it with Visual Basic and C Sharp. And it's similar to SQL, but it allows you to query and retrieve data from a variety of data sources. Um, and you can even use it to retrieve data from collections. Um, but once we get into um, using the MVC framework and the Razor page framework, we are going to be generating SQL tables and we will be retrieving data from them. Um, so we will be using link to entity. Um, the nice thing about link is that once you are familiar with it, the syntax does not change. So it is the same syntax, whether you are uh, retrieving data from collections or you're retrieving data from XML, XML or Entity Framework, it's the same syntax, which is really nice. So link does return results as objects. And so we can use the an object-oriented approach on our result set. And so this little graphic kind of shows you um, what the process is. Um, but we have our link query. We execute that against whatever data source we are using. It retrieves the result and it returns it as an object. Uh, lots of advantages of using link. Um, primary one is that for all of these data sources, it is the same language. It does not change. Um, it's not code intensive. In fact, if we use Lambda expressions, um, it, there's not as much coding as some of the other query languages. Uh, the code is readable. Um, if you understand SQL, you should have a an easier time picking up link. Um, the code is standardized. And um, there is type checking of the objects, which makes it safer. So um, just to show you that it is pretty easy to use, uh, I created a little example. And this example is using just a string array. Okay, so uh, basically we've got historic athletes here. And here's my little link query. Uh, so I am looking at name in historic athletes. So historic athletes is my data set. Name is like an alias that I'm going to use, kind of like when we do a for each and we have to kind of do an alias to process through the data. It's the same thing here. So name is going to process each one of these rows. And I could just process the rows like this um, and have select name, but I wanted to kind of filter the results. So I only want the names where the name contains J-O. Okay. And then the select statement indicates what you want to display, and I want to display the name. Okay, So this is my query. Um, when you create the query, you do store it in an object, but it does not run yet. Okay, So basically, the object is storing the query. Where it actually executes is in the for each. Okay, and so here I've got variable name in my link query. Name is the alias. And here is where I'm actually executing. Okay, and so what it's going to display is each name on a separate line. And I'm only going to get the names that have Joe in them. And so you can see uh, what it returned. And we'll be picking apart this syntax in a few minutes. But I think uh, because 
you all should have had the 178 class, you should be familiar with uh, SQL. And so there, this is very SQL-like. Okay, we've got a where clause, we've got a select clause, um, from is our source. It's just in a little different order than what we're used to. Um, so link queries implement I enumerable and I queryable, those two interfaces. And so I thought it would it may be helpful for some of you to kind of see what those interfaces uh, contain. Just kind of a bird's eye look. Uh, and then we'll take a, a little closer look at I enumerable and I queryable. So you can see um, what collections are part of each. And there are quite a few extension methods that you can actually use. And this is just a little subset of them. Um, extension methods uh, are also called operators and we'll look at some later on. Uh, the I enumerable interface lets us iterate through results uh, using it for each loop. That's why we use it. And so all of these collections um, implement I enumerable. And if you remember, they, they implement other interfaces as well. And then these are some of the extension methods that you can use. Um, I queryable provides querying capabil capabilities against a specific data source where the type of data is known. So iQueryable is what you will use for uh, database, uh, entity framework. Uh, if you are going to access Amazon data or anything uh, where the data is known, okay, you would be implementing this interface. So in our more advanced classes, we do use uh, Entity Framework. Okay, so that is where you will be working more with this. Um, so it's kind of set up the same way. You know, these are the different data sources you can access, and then these are your extension methods. As far as link syntax goes, there are two different flavors. There's query syntax and method syntax, and they are set up differently. And not all of the methods work with both. So I anything that is an exception, I do point out uh, so that you are aware of it. Um, but the link query syntax we will look at first, and then we will look at method syntax. Um, and I will say in the frameworks um, that I, I work with, um, where we are using entity framework, I do see method syntax used more often, okay? But you will be learning both. So the query syntax, is very similar to SQL. So I think you'll probably pick it up a little quicker. Um, it starts with the from keyword and it ends with the select keyword. So it's kind of weird because select is at the bottom. Uh, so the example that we looked at earlier, that first programming example started with from, ended with select. So, it is using query syntax. Um, here is another little example of query syntax. And you can see we have a list from S in string list. So string list is the object that is storing our list. S is an alias. We are going to use it to process each row here. Um, and so where is a filter? Um, we're looking for rows that contain the word tutorials. 
Okay, and so if it contains the word tutorials, we are selecting it. Okay, so you can see uh, that is what it's doing. And so what ends up being stored here is the query. Okay, and when we do the for each, we are actually executing that query. Okay, so it's in the for each that it's going to be actually processing and displaying the rows with the word tutorials. So this little graphic kind of shows how the query works. This is our result variable. Um, S is called a range, but I also call it an alias. Um, so this is your object that is representing your collection. In this example, it was a list. Um, this is your conditional, that's your where statement. Uh, where and select our query operators. And we're gonna be taking a look at a lot more of those. Um, there are about 50 query operators and we're not gonna look at all 50, <laughs> but um, I think once you look at some of them, you'll kind of get the hang of it. And I do include links um, to all of them. So you'll, you know, if you're curious, you can certainly look up how to use other ones. Um, some key points to remember that the query syntax is similar to SQL. Uh, and it starts with a from clause, it ends with a select or a group by. It can also end with a group by, and we are going to cover the group by operator, so you'll see how that works. Um, a variety of operators can be used to filter, join, group, or sort results. Okay, uh, there can be used to create an object that holds the query. And uh, link query objects created by there hold the query, which is not executed until it is run in the for each group, for each loop. So it's a deferred execution. You create the query, you store it, and then you execute it later. Um, so another little example, um, and this has an I enumerable object called names of people from, and then we've got name in STEM influencers. So here is a little string array called STEM influencers, giving it an alias of name. And basically our filter is name.length. You guys are familiar with the length property. Uh, should be less than or equal to 35. Okay, and if that's true, we're gonna select the name. And so here is where it is executed. And that is where you would see the names. Um, here's another example. Um, and this is basically going to display influencers who are still alive. So um, it's looking for the word present. So if it says present, that means that uh, these people are still here. So it's just gonna look all the way through until it finds present. And that is what ends up getting selected. Okay, so that is query syntax. Method syntax is shorter. Um, it's also called fluent syntax. And I see this a lot in uh, entity framework and in MVC applications. Uh, so it shortens the command. It's kind of powerful. Uh, and so here is a very simple example where we have uh, a result object. We have our collection object here, dot. And after the dot is where you put the extension methods. So dot where, and then we have our filter. And that's really all you need. Okay, so we're gonna basically look in this list for anything that contains tutorials. So S 
uh, represents each row. S dot contains tutorials is looking in each row for the word tutorials. Okay, and you can see this is where it's used. So again, this result is storing this query and it's executed here. Uh, let's see. All right, this example um, is very similar to what I see in MVC applications. So here I've got a class called Famous People, name, a birth year, and death year. You'll notice that the integers are nullable, which means that they may or may not have data. Okay? So it's okay for them to be empty. Uh, then I have uh, I list where I am using famous people as the data type, calling it stem people. And then you can see that I'm creating, you know, new class objects here, and I am populating them with data. Okay, so this is my data source. Uh, then I have a 20th century variable that I create. Stem people is my data source dot where. And so in my where clause, I have S, which represents um, S in this case is an object. Okay. So it is an object of famous people. So I can use S to access the name, the birth year, or the death year. In this case, I'm accessing when they died um, because I want people from the 20th century. Okay, so this is going to kind of filter uh, people by the year they were born and died so I could get 20th century people. Um, and then I want them sorted um, in reverse order, okay? and so I want them sorted by the death year so that the more current years are up at the top. Okay, so again, remember this is the class object. This is what I'm accessing for order by, okay? And so all of that's pretty straightforward. And then we've got to list. Now, normally, when we go through the for each, that is when the query executes. But to list is a little different. To list executes the query immediately, not for you to see it, <laughs> but it executes it and it stores it in the cache of your computer. So, if I was to make changes or additions to this list after I did this uh, link variable here, um, it would not get picked up because when I use to list, it's a snapshot and it's run at that time. Okay. So it's fine that I did it here because nothing happened afterwards. So when I run it here, it's actually going to the cache and retrieving what was already created because to list ran this query. Okay. And it's kind of stored already. Okay. And so I've got my object here. And I can use that to access the different things that are in each of my um, class objects. Okay, so normally, I just want to reiterate this. Normally, when you create any type of query, it is stored in your link object and it's run later. Okay, and that is true unless you use to list. Because to list 
actually runs it at that time and puts it in the cache. Um, a couple of things that you should remember. The method syntax uses the extension methods and the full Lambda expressions. You chain these together with dots. So stem people is my data source. I've got dot where, dot order by, dot to list. And it's all referring to stem people. There can be used to create the object that holds the query and the queries are not executed immediately unless they include the to list extension method. And I did mention that there's like 50 of these. So here is a fuller list of um, query operators and extension methods. And we are going to take a look at some of them. We're not gonna look at all of them, <laughs> but we'll look at some of them. Um, and I have, like 15 total programming examples. Um, so lots and lots of examples for you to look at. The um, select actually is required in a in query syntax, but not in method syntax. You do not have to use it in method syntax, only query syntax. Okay, so in query syntax, it is the last part of the syntax, okay? And so far, um, we basically looked at lists and it's selected everything, okay? But, you know, what if you want to use it kind of the same way that we would in SQL, where you're selecting specific fields or properties? Um, there's a couple different ways you can do it. So here, you'll notice that I have a class called student and I am implementing it in an I list. And then here, I'm using I enumerable and I've told it I'm gonna have a string, okay? So all students is what I'm um, creating and I'm accessing student list which is this, and I'm filtering on age, so I want over 18. I'm gonna sort it by the student's name in ascending order, and here is my select, okay? And this is method syntax, by the way. Uh, how do I know? Uh, because it doesn't use the keyword from. <laughs> um, so here is select. So here is my little object. And I'm using that to access the name, the major, the age. And I have formatted this as a string because that is what I'm saying I'm creating. So all students is going to be producing this string. Okay. And so how do we execute this? Have to use a for each. S is an alias for each row of all students. And here I'm printing it out and it's going to be printing out this string. Now, chances are um, you aren't gonna want I enumerable to return a string. You're probably gonna want something more like a uh, class object you know, with different properties. So you can set it up that way. Uh, so here we've got I enumerable. And what I want to create is another, you know, student list. And I'm gonna call it all students, okay? And I'm using the current student list as my data source. And it's the same criteria. The age is going to be over 18. I'm going to sort it by the student's name, but the select is different. So instead of returning a output string, I am going to be for each one of these rows returning a new student. Um, and I'm filling in the ID, the name, the major, and the age. 
Okay, so what it's basically going to do when I run it, and I'm going to run it down here, okay, what it's going to do, it's going to go through each row. And it's going to check the age. Is the age greater than 18? Yes, it is. Okay, and so it's going to go through and do that, and it's going to get a result set. Okay, of the, the rows that have an age greater than 18. Then it's going to sort them. And then for each of those rows, okay, it is going to create a new student uh, record okay, with the data in it. Okay, and that is what is going to get printed out. Now I can pick whatever parts I want. Okay, I, I can show ID if I want to. Um, in this case, I chose not to. I chose just to use the name, the age, and the major. And in case you're wondering what these little T's are, they are just like the, the backward slash N, which is a carriage return. Backward slash T is like a tab, and it helps you create columns. That's all it does. Okay. So they're called escape characters. Okay, so this little example is just showing you just a little different way to format um, your result. Uh, the where clause, we've looked at several examples, so you know it is to filter. Um, so I have some additional examples here. I can see my spacing got messed up, um, <laughs> but um, you can see you can actually have more than one where clause. And if you have more than one, they are cumulative. So when we have uh, age greater than 20, major equals hospitality, it's only going to select rows that have both of those conditions. Uh, and here we have uh, method syntax, uh, basically illustrating the same thing. We, we're looking at uh, age greater than 20, we have an additional where or major. Okay, so you can kind of see how that works. And then here is a programming example uh, that you can copy and paste and run uh, with these uh, multiple where clauses. Uh, order by, order by descending is used for sorting. Um, order by is used in both the syntax and um, the query syntax and the method syntax, both versions of link. Uh, but order by descending is only in method syntax. Okay, So if you wanted to sort in descending order and you're using query syntax, there is a uh, descending option that you can use with order by. Um, but I do have some examples. You can see this is query syntax, order by student name. Um, here is method syntax. It's basically going in descending order by student name. Um, if you wanted to do multiple columns or multiple fields, it's a little easier in query syntax because you do order by, and then you can just separate them with commas. Uh, in method syntax, you can't do it that way. You would use order by or order by descending for the first one. And for the second one, you have to use either then by or then by descending. So, I did do an example that kind of shows you how to use this. I can see my, it's going to drive me nuts, <laughs> my spacing got messed up. Um, but you can see I've got the uh, query syntax, which orders by age and major. And then I have the method syntax, where I've got dot order by, which is major. And the secondary sort, I have dot then by student name. Okay, and we can run this so you guys can see. So 
Oop, this happens sometimes when I am working with um, HTML. It likes to get rid of my angle brackets. Because you know, angle brackets in HTML have different meaning. So, so sometimes it just, uh, they just disappear. All right, so now they're here. Uh, so here we've got students sorted by age and major. Uh, remember, this was our query syntax that we used. So you can see we've got age. And then for ones that are the same age, it's by major. And then here we've got major. And then when we have the same major, you can see that it's name. Group by. So group by uh, is actually kind of cool uh, because it uh, allows you to create groups and display the data by the groupings that it creates. Uh, so I think probably just showing you the example uh, is probably the best way uh, to look at it. So here I've got uh, the uh, student class and here's my um, data source, which is a list of those students. And you can see that I'm going to group by age. Our So our data source is student list. S is our kind of like our object um, or alias. Uh, and before we group, um, you would have to do any of your filtering or sorting. The last thing uh, should be grouping. So any other manipulating that you want to do has to be done before that. So here I'm going to sort it by age. And then I am doing the grouping by age. Now, if I don't sort it, It'll still group it just fine, but when I go to display it, um, the ages won't be in sequence. Um, so when I display it, when it does the grouping, it's got a key property that you can access that tells you how it was grouped. So if we're grouping by age, the key is going to be the different age groups that it created. So here I am printing out uh, age group, and then it'll say like 18, 21, you know, however it did the grouping. Um, and then it also has what's called an inner collection, which are, you know, in this case, the students that are in that group. And so I can kind of iterate through that inner collection and print them out. So I'm going to print out how it grouped it, and then I'm going to print out all of the items that are in that group. Okay. And again, um, I've got grouped age where the query is being stored and the alias in this for each group or for each loop is age group. Okay. And then I've got an inner for each where I'm looking at the age group. So the alias is S. Um, so you can do the same thing with method syntax. It's a little shorter though. Um, so I decided to also group by major. So I'm taking the same student list, sorting it, because you still have to you know, sort or filter first. I'm sorting it by age, and then I am grouping by major. Okay, And then the for each loop is going to process in a very similar fashion. Because no matter if you use the query syntax or method syntax, you're going to have a key based on how you did your grouping. 
and you're going to have that inner collection. So uh, I did uh, display the output here so that you could see that the first one that was done uh, grouping by age, printed age group, and then this is the key that got printed. And then this is the inner collection. Okay, so for the age group of 21, this is the collection that it printed out. Okay, and then we moved on uh, to the method syntax, which grouped by major. So here we've got CIT, and then this is that inner collection. Okay, aerospace engineering is the key. This is the collection. Marketing is the key. Okay, so you can kind of see how that works. Now we've looked at several examples with contains um, and basically contains is used in the where clause. Okay, I just wanted to point that out. Um, and it it's a filter that limits what is retrieved. And so here is an example with contains. This is method syntax. And in a uh, collection that is based on a class, okay, calling our collection student list. Um, we are using S to represent uh, a class object. And so we have s.student name, so we can access that. And then dot contains is what we are looking for. Okay, and that is all a parameter for the where extension method. Okay, so we are filtering uh, based on student name. Then we are going to be sorting our results. And you can see in this case, we are returning a string. So I've got this little output string formatted. Now, if you wanted to do kind of the same thing with query syntax, this is how you would have to do it. Uh, so we're still using student list where major, where s dot major. So s is our little alias. Uh, it represents a class object. It's s dot major dot contains. And then ho is going to retrieve all hospitality majors. And we're going to order by the major, and then we're going to select our data. So here you can kind of see the results, and it would display all of the hospitality uh, majors. The aggregate functions that we had in SQL, uh, we have something similar. We have, uh, they're called aggregation operators or extension methods. Uh, and so we have average count, max, and sum that we can use. And you can code it um, with kind of no limits, or you can try to limit what it's looking at as far as data goes. So uh, average does exactly what you think it will. <laughs> well, it calculates an average returns a decimal, that's double or float value. Um, if you want to code it with no limit, uh, it's just your list.average. And then you're telling it what property you want to average. Okay. Um, and if you want to limit maybe ages greater than 20, um, you have to throw in a where clause before you do the average. And that'll filter it. Um, I'm going to skip to to max and sum because they are very similar to average. Um, so max returns the largest. And again, it is your whatever your data source is dot max. And then whatever field property it is that you want the largest of. Um, and if you wanted to add a limit, again, um, you have to use the where clause. 
Um, sum is very similar. So uh, set up the same way. It, you've got your uh, collection.sum. You got to tell it uh, what exactly you know it is that you want to total. And then um, if you need a limit, you have to throw in a where clause. Now, I skipped over count because count is a little different when it comes to adding a limit. So count just returns the number of elements, okay? And so if you don't want a limit, it works exactly the same as the others, right? It's, it's just whatever the collection dot count, and then you tell it what property you wanna count. If you want a limit, you don't use a where clause. Okay, you actually code it right in the count. So if I wanted to limit to the age greater than 20, I would add greater than 20 to age and pass that to count. So that is a little different than the others. Uh, so this first example shows Quite a few things, so I'm going to run it. So you'll notice that I did add tuition. <laughs> Had to add another uh, column to this or an, another uh, field. And so uh, the first is going to um, basically just count, you know, everything. Uh, and then I'm going to average. Uh, and then I'm going to retrieve the max. Actually, I think this should have age in there as well. doesn't like that. Nope, we'll take it out. We'll leave count alone. All right, so we got our student list. We're doing uh, just counting everything, uh, counting rows, I should say. Uh, then for average, we're averaging age, we're giving the max of age, and for the sum, we are grabbing the uh, tuition column. And you'll notice I did a string format on a couple of these. All right, and so these are not supposed to have limits. Uh, then I added some limits in. So this is gonna be for different student groups. So first I'm gonna do a count and I did put a limit in here where I've got the age greater than 30. Okay, so it's gonna count the number of students who are over 30. Uh, then I'm averaging the age of students over 30. Uh, I'm finding what the maximum age is and I am basically setting a cap. So of the students under 40, what is the maximum age? So you can see I've got a where here where I'm filtering under 40. And then from that group, you know, what is the maximum age? Uh, and then for totaling tuition, I am filtering uh, so that I'm, we're only looking at CIT majors and we're gonna total up their tuition. So let's run this. Okay, so you can kind of see how that works. So this second group had the where clause added uh, to all of them except count where I actually had to put the operator right inside. And then the first one really doesn't have any limits. Okay? We're just specifying columns. So this 
next example just shows you, you know, on a very simple list of numbers, how you would use these operators. And you can see how simple that is. It's just the list dot and then whatever it is you want to calculate. The join operator is probably something you're not going to have to use a lot um, if you are using a database in the background. Um, and that is just because uh, the tables should already be related. <laughs> so, um, but with collections like what we are looking at, yeah, if you want to, you know, share data amongst uh, the collections, you do have to run a join. And so there's a couple different versions of it. Um, uh, basically, it's going to run an inner join. And uh, the parameters that we will be using are the outer sequence. So that's like table one. The inner sequence, which is table two. You've got to give it your outer key. you got to give it your inner key. And then you have to tell it um, how you want the results. Okay, so, um, and the order that you put things is pretty specific. Like you have to do your outer key before the inner key. Okay, so this kind of breaks down a command. And then this is the program that utilizes that command. And so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be taking the student list and joining it with the student club list. Okay, so um, our table one, so to speak, is that outer sequence is uh, student list. The inner is student club list. Uh, when we're working with our outer table, we are going to call the objects student. And our key is student.studentID. And when we're working with that inner sequence, table two, we're going to be calling the objects club. And so then our key is club.studentID. Okay, and we're gonna take the student and the club object, both of them, and create a kind of a new uh, object or record out of the data. And so we're going to create student name, and that's going to come from student.studentName. We're going to create age, and that's coming from student.age. And then we're also going to add the club name, which is coming from club.clubName. And you'll notice that I did not include the IDs. All right, so we got three different lists here. And then we've got this join that we just looked at. Uh, so this is the students who belong to clubs. And remember that all of this is stored here. So when we do our for each, it's executing. Okay, And so you can kind of pull out what it is that you want to display. And then you can see that I did another one just for fun using query syntax. Uh, so here I've got from S in student list. So I'm going to be re referring to anything that is in student list using an S. I'm going to join that with student GPA list, which I'm referring to as G. Uh, on, so we've got from join on S.studentID equals G.studentID. So this looks a lot more SQL-like. Okay, and then I'm selecting what I want retrieved, which is the student name from S, which is student list, the GPA from student GPA list, and the major, which is coming from the student list. Okay, that's stored in student GPAs. Here is where it is executed. So here is the club output, and then here's the student GPA output. 
Now, the last thing that we're going to talk about is distinct. Um, if you're working with a database, you are not going to have duplicate rows um, if your database has primary keys. Um, but if you are working with collections like we are, you could have some duplicates. And so distinct is a way that you can um, get rid of duplicates, but it only works with method syntax. So keep that in mind. Um, I did a real simple example here. So I've got a food list and a number list. And you can see I've got some duplicates. And so um, here I've got a variable where I'm storing the food list dot distinct. So it's going to get rid of my duplicates. And here I've got a variable where I'm storing number list dot distinct. Okay, and they will get rid of the duplicates. So that is super easy to understand, pretty straightforward. Okay, so if you compare to the data, you'll notice that my duplicates are gone. So objects are, is a little bit more uh, complicated um, because you can't just use distinct on objects um, because it, it has no way they're more complex and it has no way to compare them. So you end up having to create a new little class uh, based on I equality comparer. Um, and what this little class does is it lets you um, use a class object. You pull in two different objects from the class. Okay. And it lets you compare different properties to see if they are equal. Okay. And if they're equal, it means they're the same. And um, so it's not going to uh, let you, it's not going to include the data in the result set, basically. Um, if they're not equal, then it will return you know, the object. So that's kind of how it works behind the scenes. Um, it's kind of hard to see that with the two methods the way they are, because there is some activity going on that you cannot see. So I have another little version of um, iEquality Compare. This first one is basically looking to see if the IDs are the same. Um, the second one is checking, um, I'm using my club class and it's checking everything. Um, it's checking the ID and the club name. And you'll notice that it's actually uh, converting the club names to lowercase. Um, so that it's the same casing when it's checking to see if they are the same or not. Okay, and so both of these examples I am going to use in this program. Okay, so again, I've got iQuality Compare. I'm using my student club class. Here I'm just comparing IDs and here I'm looking at everything. All right, so looking at this, I've got uh, my student list and I have my student clubs. And I purposefully have duplicates in the clubs. Okay, I did that on purpose. So the first distinct, um, I just want to get rid of duplicates, period. Okay, so I'm storing it in distinct students. And so you can see I've got student club list, which is this, dot distinct. And in order to get unique values, I have to pass it this method. Okay. And this method is looking at the entire row and it's comparing. 
it's comparing one object to the next, row by row. And what it's going to return are the rows that are unique. Okay, that is the idea. Okay, so I had to do a little bit more work in order to get this distinct to work. Okay, I had to actually create this little class. Okay, but once it is finished running, okay, I can actually execute it and the results will be unique. Okay, now for the second version, what I wanted to do was just count the number of students that are in clubs, but you'll notice that some students are in more than one club. So I want the IDs to be unique. The club names don't have to be unique, just the IDs do. Um, so for this, I had to implement a little different version of I equality comparer. Um, and I'm calling it student comparer ID. And so instead of comparing everything that's in my class, I'm just looking at IDs. So it's going to end up returning the unique IDs to me, okay? And so here I have the distinct command where I am getting those unique IDs and then I execute count. So now it's just counting unique IDs instead of all of them. And then it prints it out. And so this does work pretty slick. Um, it's kind of a lot of work having to use <laughs> the extra class that I have to implement to actually get distinct uh, rows in my class. And normally it's not a problem um, if you are interfacing with a database, but with collections, you can have bad data. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and run this. Okay, and so you can see the first one that, um, now this was the entire row. So it's the combination of the ID and the club that has to be unique. So you should not see any duplicates for ID and club. Um, and the second one is ID only, the unique ID. So how many students are in clubs? So we don't wanna double count student one or student five, right? We just wanna know how many students are in clubs. Okay, so that is kind of a summary of the those different operators that I think you will see most often, but it's not an inclusive list. Uh, so I did include what I call a link cheat sheet. Um, this one is kind of nice because it's giving you the query and the method syntax. Okay, um, I also have a code academy, oops. Looks like I'll have to transfer that again. Sorry, guys. I have a Code Academy cheat sheet that you'll be able to look at. And I have an Entity Framework one that you will also be able to look at. Um, and it just kind of summarizes some commands because uh, there's a lot to remember here. Now, if you wanted to learn more about Link and you wanted to practice coding online, this is an excellent resource. And here are your query operators and you can go in they will explain how they're used and they have a lot of triads so that you can practice. Okay, so um, I will get that Code Academy one up there. Um, but if you have any questions about link queries, I would be happy to answer them. Uh, it is something I'm really familiar with. It is something you will become really familiar with because you use them in a variety of C-sharp frameworks.